The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Today on the Clean Power Hour, update from the DOE. Jennifer Granholm has some very big plans. Looking forward to learning more about that. Ocean floating solar is a thing in Singapore. You heard me correct, ocean floating. Net metering is under attack in California. Net metering is under attack all over the country. It's just coming to California, really uh, coming to a head there. Biden has a huge Green New Deal infrastructure plan in the works, and the Pennsylvania state governor has announced that they're going to get after it. Welcome to the show, John Weaver, the commercial solar guy and my co-host. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour. Timothy, I hope everything is well. Uh, crystal blue, sunny skies today outside and a cool temperature, so I'm sure that the solar generation is peaking. Uh, I've seen headlines in California that the numbers are looking nice out there occasionally. So, so it's solar record setting season. All your customers must like you right now. Yeah, it is a uh, record solar weather, sunny and cool and windy. So if you are coming from outside the industry, cooler solar panels produce more electricity. So it's a thing. And um, uh, ironically, I'm, I'm hosting Yada Energy later this week on the show, yeah. John. And there, and, and I know you've met uh, Omid Badkube, the CEO. They're doing rooftop storage, mm -hmm. which is not the most logical place to put batteries because of the extreme cold and heat. But um, we digress. So <laughs> I don't know if you have an opinion about about uh, Yada Energy's technology. It's um, I, some of the aspects of it, I like it. I, I had a conversation with, uh, with him and I think Scott is their uh, business development manager. And uh, first off, the potential functionality, and this is beyond before we talk about the environment, but the potential functionality is pretty neat. Uh, you could get you know, four to eight panels per inverter. You can do a two to one DC to AC ratio. You can DC couple the energy storage on a solar panel level. Those are all kind of neat little, cool little topics. Um, uh, in reference to whether or not it's a good place to put a battery in a very hot and cold environment, you know, DNV GL, DNV put out a great report saying, no, that's a terrible idea. Keep it very temperate and managed. But I will say this, uh, people keep doing things that I'm wrong about. And I just have to, I guess, accept that I'm gonna be wrong occasionally. And, um, and things work out sometimes. So I'm just going to watch and I'm going to cheer because I like the potential functionality and I'm going to pretend that they're smarter than me and have figured out some of the bigger challenges, but they got to be there. I mean, that heat and cold thing has got to be there. It's got to wear on them somehow. Um, I just don't know enough. I don't know enough about the packaging yet to be like, rah, rah, rah. Uh, but I said the same thing about inverters and optimizers. I'm like, why the heck would you put all those electronics up there? And now I'm like, well, maybe we should have a touch more. <laughs> so I, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch. I'll say that. Yeah. And they are going to try to disrupt the power electronics industry as well. And uh, so I don't think we're going to see their, their new product announcements this week, unfortunately, but soon. Well, I wanted to kick off the show with a cool video by STI Norland that I just stumbled upon and STI Norland is a lesser known uh, entity here in the US, but they're a major tracker manufacturer and EPC out of Spain. And you've heard me talk about the Spanish market as mm -hmm. we have an Axiona project being developed in Northern Illinois. It's a 120 megawatt project called High Point. It's being built under a wind farm that Axiona developed a few years ago. And so they've issued an RFP for racking and installers on this 120 megawatt project. So I started to get all this inbound um, contact from the Spanish developers, EPCs and manufacturers. And apparently STI Norland is one of them that is vertically integrated. And, uh, but you'll see some very familiar looking uh, technology here. It reminds me a lot of PB Hardware, if you've ever looked at PB Hardware's product, John, so I wonder if they have a partnership. Um, but uh, 
it was just a cool little I like this. Litzy video about their product. Yeah, totally cool. Somebody had fun. I like that. I like that. There we put out a video. More, there are many more manufacturers of solar trackers than meets the eye. It's easy to only see the top three or four. And uh, because they take up so much oxygen in the room, the array technologies and next trackers of the world, right? Uh, rightfully so. I mean, they're so type their dominance is well deserved. Type in next to sun. Uh, well, I may have mentioned them on prior shows. The vertical panels. Uh, we got our first quote from them recently. Yeah. We're going to be uh, doing some modeling, some sales of them in our farming region, our community solar projects. Uh, you know, a lot of these regions, they don't, the farmers don't want to lose their farming. You know, even if it's the money's whatever, it's still what they do. You know, it's just like, that's how you identify. You, you do your farming. And, you know, okay. maybe it's a simple farming, like uh, hay farming, but whatever. Here's that um, product. There it is. So two panels high, uh, bifacial. They face east, west. I, I haven't seen all the hard numbers yet, but my uh, the lead engineer told me that the power production numbers are like 95% of a standard south-facing 20-degree, 20 25-degree project. And uh, if it's 95% and 90% of the land is still usable, I, I, feel, very, I feel very special walking into a sales pitch saying, listen, farmer, I'm not taking your land. I'm just adding rows to it that are a little harder for you to navigate. And I'm going to pay you good money for that annoyance. And here's how it's going to work. And uh, as long as they got the right equipment, you know, seven, eight, 10 meters wide, I, you know, we know the equipment that's being used in our markets. And so, uh, I don't know. I feel, I feel really strong about the opportunity with this product. Um, uh, you'll hear about me in over the next few months talking about it. So we'll see. Cool. Yeah. I look forward to learning how that product pencils and uh, I can't argue with your logic. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to argue with myself as much as I can on it to see what's going to be wrong, especially O and M cleaning it. Um, but uh, we'll see, you know, we'll find out. And apparently you're on a mission to, show the world that electric vehicles are not a new thing. Uh, you dug up another beautiful photograph of electric vehicles. I presume this is in New York, but I don't know. Um, I have no idea. I, 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 to be honest, I'm not digging it up. It's actually the Twitter verse that gives it to me. And this is my TV. I just scroll through it and all, I, I follow really cool and smart people. And uh, I just, you know, pay attention and it's neat. I love this. I love this old stuff, man. Dig those nice fat cables there. Uh, the, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's amazing that, that the ice engine just basically wiped the EV off the face of the earth, even though there was a time when they were going head to head back in the early 1900s. Um, but such is, such is the, uh, the world of new technology and um, how people respond to it. So, so you mentioned Granholm and her videos, which, which plans, because I've been listening to, you know, you have the huge infrastructure plan later. So that's something that Biden wants to talk about this summer, but right now Granholm, they talked about 30 gigs of offshore wind by 2030. They're talking about other capacities. Uh, do you know what was going on? I mean, what about the perovskite stuff? Oh, there it is. That's the DOE. Perovskites from Granholm. I'm really interested in that conversation and what they're doing there. I'm going to write an article on this specifically. So when you started talking about it, it kind of piqued my interest. Yeah, you know, uh, the DOE, Jennifer and her team, they gave a brief update. Um, the title is 100% Clean, How DOE Solar Investments Will Help to Achieve Ambitious Decarbonization Goals. It was live streamed on March 25th, so last Thursday. And uh, I watched the live stream. It was it was good. There were many presenters, and uh, you know some technical experts. But the gist and the takeaway for me, John, was that they're doubling down on 
solar technology, they're not just saying, oh, the, the crystalline PV module is the end all and be all and let's go. Even though, of course, we have plenty of good technology today to make the clean energy transition. We don't need a whole lot of innovation uh, and innovation, but they are doubling down on perovskites explicitly. Okay, perovskites, let's face it, they're in the lab today. The, you know, I, kn I know that we've we've referenced some some products that are going to be stacking perovskites on traditional right P uh, PV technology and and bringing that to market. And that is one of the cool things about perovskites is they allow for translucence, and so you can embed perovskite solar technology into windows of buildings like a high rise, which is traditionally clad in glass. Now it could be clad in solar and let in the light because if you stand behind a traditional solar panel it's not letting a whole lot of light through right its goal is to absorb the vast majority of that radiation um but the, so and they gave some numbers which i don't have in front of me but something like 20 million dollars a year into yep. perovskite research but also csp what they call csp uh version three so Today, CSP concentrated solar power uses molten salt as the energy collector, right? We're talking about an array of mirrors like the Ivanpah solar plant. Just Google that, Ivanpah. It's a big CSP plant in California. And all the light is gathered on this tower, converts salt to molten, and then that drives a steam turbine. Well, apparently they're working on what they call particulate uh, energy collectors and they didn't give the chemistry so I don't know anything about the chemistry but that was very interesting that they're going after next gen CSP I mean it makes sense on some level it's just <clears throat> CSP got eclipsed by PV John yeah. I don't know when that when that happened what year that those lines crossed but that's why we don't see a lot of CSP happening in the US is because PV is more cost effective and um, but I say both end, right? I'm all about the both end. I think that there's room for new, better, and more technologies in the market. So bring it on. Yeah. So, um, so the perovskites really, really interest me. Uh, you know, I, I foresee solar panel efficiencies doubling and the price having. And uh, I don't think that's an extreme statement to make. Uh, and, you know, doubling from our upper edge might be an extreme st statement because our upper edge right now is like 23%. So getting a 46% efficiency panel is pretty significant, but, you know, getting to 35, um, 34, 40, the, the, that's not a outside of the bounds thing anymore. And, uh, and perovskites, I think will be part of it. Um, CSP, you know, start getting whooped sometime in the early to mid 20 teens if only because gas peakers got super efficient at scaling up and down and we haven't needed batteries yet. And because the grid has become more flexible, more manageable to absorb the, uh, the strong daytime solar and the inter intermittence of the wind. And so CSP has just been eclipsed by partially cheap gas that uh, ramps up and fast down really fast within our windows of uh, uh, predictability. So we just haven't needed the storage yet. I like the particulate concept. I've read about people being able to hold energy in, in little cells for months on end. And uh, I keep wondering if transmission and distributed lithium ion and car batteries are going to whoop all this long-term storage needs. Um, I just, there's so many ways to manage uh, long-term energy storage risk uh, with transmission, with hydrogen, with vehicle to grid, with demand response, with lithium ion itself. Because, you know, you don't have to make the lithium ion battery run from 6 to 9 p.m. It can fill up at daytime and it can run anytime from 6 to 9, 9 to, 9 to 12, 12 to 1, 1 to 3, 3 to 5. It's just, you know, so I, I don't know yet, but I love everything that the DOE does just because it's just, it pushes stuff. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to write an article on the perovskites to figure out what they're more deeper because there's three different perovskite programs that are ongoing that I heard them announce and I want to write about them. So, so you have an article for me from me at some point on it. Cool. 
Yep. I, uh, I'm excited about perovskites. The other challenge with perovskites is they use lead in a lot of the chemistries. Lead is, of course, a toxic metal. Um, and so we just don't want lots of lead being spread around in the environment. So they have to solve that problem. And I know that they are working on lead-free or low lead solutions. I don't know what the state of the art is right now, but that is, uh, that is one challenge that perovskites face. We're going to have to be uh, selective about. Yeah, I know. <laughs> about Sorry, us. Tim. I, I always put too many stories on your list. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just as guilty, and um, I do want to talk about the Biden uh, infrastructure plan, but I want to put that off for a little bit. I want to I want to talk about some some things that come up repeatedly on the show, like floating solar. So let's talk about floating solar in Singapore. They now have a, and not that this is the first uh, floating solar power plant on, on the ocean. Um, and, and obviously this is very near shore in a protected harbor of some kind. You know, Singapore is an island. Uh, I've been there uh, many years ago and cool place. Uh, it's hyper modern and uh, very clean, very well run very efficient and you go to jail if you spit on the sidewalk so don't spit on the sidewalk um, or worse get caned in public or something like that they're big on corporal punishment but it uh it makes society work with a certain clock like uh efficiency so here is a electric story singapore completes one of the first floating solar farms on the sea and it is a five megawatt power plant and you got a nice shot of the um, inverters on a uh, barge and then cables going underwater to the shore. And um, I don't know what the racking is that they're using in this project. Uh, Seal and Tear is of course the, the dominant player, but there's, there's some other Chinese companies that are going after the floating racking space. Beiwa Ri is going after the floating racking space. And I think if we build some sort of robotic sub chunks of floating solar, like, uh, you know, how we have strings and we figure out the smallest minimal chunk and we let them come together and fall apart in the open oceans, uh, we put a little AI on them. So, you know, maybe it's like 20 panels. It's a nice 1500 volt string. We can make it whatever we want. And uh, we can just start letting them loose one at a time. And they'll slowly find each other and connect. And we'll just have like one giant, you know, various large cables just coming up at points in the middle of the ocean. And we just build them on the side of the ocean and put little tiny things on them so they can work their way out there. They're solar powered. I mean, they got electricity and they just kind of migrate out there. Clink. When a big storm comes, they just fall apart and spread out and then clink and come back together. And, you know, I think uh, we can make all the elect we make all the electricity we freaking need forever, man. We don't need land if we really wanted to push ourselves and be freaky, you know, giant species that take over the planet, like truly take it over. Because right now we're just trying our best and we're, we're moving along. But if we want to take over the oceans, that's 70 percent. There's so much energy that's that. Oh. You know, we, we, we always hear that little thing that in one hour we get enough energy for the year. Yeah. And like, it's, it's like seconds to get at the electricity for a day. It's like, ding. Oh, well, overpowered, shut off the batteries. It's like 1201 done. You know, it's, it's, uh, we could, we could, and, and I'm going to go hang out at MIT and I'm going to hang out with a bunch of smart kids and we're just going to write the first AI small section floating solar uh, machine. And uh, we're just going to start letting them loose and let people invest in them. This, there'll be an international water, so we don't have to worry about any SEC regulation. And uh, we'll launch them off from the Cayman Islands. How's that? <laughs> and, and there'll be independent little LLCs floating on the ocean, each one just slowly hooking up to a centralized uh, import Thing or I, mean, I think that is one of the challenges with floating solar is what happens when there is a storm. And there's, there are some amazing videos. I don't know if I can find that while we're talking of post storm floating solar going wrong. But um, 
I like the idea of, of either coming apart or going under the water. I know that there's, yeah. there's some yeah. turbine manufacturers that have come up with that solution also where the, the whole tower would fl- sink down underneath the waves during uh, a really big storm. I don't know if anybody's executed on that technology yet, but because that's that would be super cool to have an, uh, a wind turbine that's able to go underwater. But um, I mean, I see no reason the the solar panels themselves are very watertight. Um, I, I don't know about the wiring, right? How all those connections would handle the, it's the connections that I would worry about. Um, although they must be using a lot of uh, stainless steel out there because talk about a harsh environment. The ocean is a super, super harsh, yeah. corrosive environment. It says they're going to build a 60 megawatt uh, floating solar farm on the Tenge Reservoir in Northern Singapore. So Singapore, those island nations, they're, they're so land is of such a premium that you see them making some of these first innovations you know i had i have a plan drawn up to do a, a solar floating solar project here in central illinois but the the cost is about 25 20 to 25% more than ground mount right. solar and and so if you have a lot of land available it's hard to make the floating component pencil hmm. i th- i think uh I saw South Korea, they're building, I think, the largest floating wind farm somewhere in the eight gig range. And I think they're doing like two gigs via Hanwha of floating solar on some reservoirs of their own. And uh, I think that's neat. I'm just, it's fun to watch. I mean, we we do have a a near infinite energy supply future potential. And uh, and if you ever want to see a floating solar farm on fire, uh, type in Japan, floating so- solar fire. And uh, <laughs> yes. it happened about two years ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, it was just like, oof. And, you know, we're still learning. So that's going to happen. So moving on, every school child in America knows the name Bluebird for the most part because they're a popular bus manufacturer. And now they're getting into apparently the EV bus space. What's the story? Well, so Bluebird has been making EV buses for a while uh, and Bluebird's pretty cool. Um, there's, there's a few electric buses that I've seen out there. Um, this one in particular got my attention though, because it's the first uh, commercial use of V to G. I've seen at least two, and V2G is vehicle to grid. So we're literally using the school bus battery as a revenue generator to complement the power grid at the local facilities. Uh, In this case, I think it's literally the school. I I don't know the exact location, but what it is, it's you get a lower priced bus. I mean, that's essentially what it comes down to. The price of school transportation is now going to fall because the school bus will be able to be used during off hours, just like your business gets to use the roof, which prior was a wasted resource, all this sunlight, just heating up your building. That's it. Uh, Now you have a roof that generates a valuable item. Now the school buses, which we have, like it's like hundreds of thousands. If I, I, because I've done the research on this before, even with the battery size and everything, like a school bus could meet, two three percent of peak demand in the u.s like it's not a trivial number it's like six seven hundred thousand school buses and uh you know tens of millions of kids ride them per day type of thing and uh and in san diego and virginia they're already testing using the school bus to charge during strategic times to output now they're just going to start hooking them up to the school so imagine if you know the the school bus is uh getting filled up overnight or during the daytime from, you know, uh, 9 a.m. until 2 p.m., 1 p.m., and then they head out. They come back in the evening peak. They still have some electricity in them, so you just plug them into the grid, beat the crap out of the batteries until 9, 10 p.m., and then at 11 p.m., start charging them with wind or hydroelectricity or something cheap and clean, and at 7 a.m., they're full, and you can drive them out for two, three hours, and then 
you know, you run your equations, you know how much you need to put into them overnight so that you can get that cheap solar during the daytime or whatever it is. You got cheap wind in the Midwest. I mean, the number one thing about an electric school bus, Tim, and this is just, this is the biggest thing in my, my entire electric school bus thing is we sit in the back of the bus where the exhaust is as little tiny kids for hours and hours and hours out of our existence. And we suck in fumes and there's plenty of research that shows that this, and we have our youngest people. And ironically, we're sending them to learn in, in giant machines that pollute, physically pollute their structure. And an electric school bus is worth much more than some KWHs on the grid. It's, it's literally going to make us smarter. And, and, you know, that's, Anything else. If anybody ever says that school bus is too expensive, I'm just going to tell them to shut up, shut up and don't be dumb and don't, don't put your mouth on a, on a hose of pollution. So anyway, you heard my little rant there on school buses. Plus they pay for themselves now. There you go. Yeah. We don't know. Uh, most Americans are, are naive about the cost of diesel pollution. It emits particulates that get in our lungs, that gets in our blood and causes disease. So cleaning up our school bus fleet and all of our bus fleets is a, uh, is a necessary thing. And love the story, V to G, go Bluebird. I had no idea that they were so innovative. <clears throat> v to G, there's a V to H also. V to H is where your battery will just connect to your house and offer backup services, grid forming services. It won't necessarily connect to the grid. So V to G is revenue v to h is personal small business backup cool well let's talk about uh the biden infrastructure plan this is a bit of a hot potato and i am no expert but at face value they are talking about a three trillion dollar spending plan on infrastructure and health and human services it's it's a both and but 400 billion of this, John, would be earmarked for cleaning the grid. And what I'm excited about is that the Biden administration wants to net zero the economy or the, the US uh, economy and infrastructure by 2050. Okay, we wanna go net, net zero by 2050. That's a great goal. It's a necessary goal. We're actually beating the Chinese on that by doing by setting that goal. They're, the Chinese goal is 2060, according to Andy Klump on my show this morning. And uh, and the Chinese have been going after it for a while. So now you can a plan's a plan, and you can achieve that plan faster or slower. Um, the way they're going to pay for this apparently is by raising taxes on the wealthy, meaning anyone who makes over $400,000 a year, which is the biking economic model. And I, I support that uh, basic strategy of taxing the rich and creating a better infrastructure for the masses, for all of us, because as we saw with the highway system after World War II, that was just, it catalyzes tremendous growth. And as we saw with Texas, the grid is limping along, but it's easily knocked off its feet. <laughs> and, and that creates ripples. Uh, and I am curious to know more about what you think about the ripples from the Texas grid collapse, but what do you make of the Biden plan? And I will put the VOA news story on the screen here. Uh, I mean, this is part of his uh, uh, campaign push. The, you know, it's so hard for me sometimes to um, apply these large infrastructure packages directly to how my business runs in my nine to five, because there's so many different pieces and, you know, there's research. Like for instance, we spoke about the Department of Energy research earlier. Uh, that's awesome. And I love writing about it, but does it directly affect my business today? So, so there's that. It's always a challenge. Um, when it comes to some of this stuff, though, you know, setting goals, hard goals of percentages that filter down toward the states and force states to take on certain things or give states funding, that starts getting interesting. Um, 
there's different tools they're going to use to get that infrastructure deployed. And for instance, these uh, <clears throat> the tools like the, somebody submitted the tax credit bill. They shifted the somebody said we should make the tax credit a grant again, and it was suggested that could become an amendment to this bill as a tool to help it meet its goals. And you account for the dollar amount spent and everything within the government, a part of the package. And so it's like, and that's a hardcore directly applicable law. Um, this is just him following through on his campaign pledges. And these are very generally popular things. Infrastructure is popular. Uh, the country, you know, even the prior uh, regime had ideas about infrastructure week that never materialized for four years. So this is really somebody actually following through on what they said they were going to do regarding infrastructure. So I'm super interested in seeing it. Um, you know, it'd be really cool if we got some proper roads and power lines and maybe some trains in, uh, on the coasts to move a few hundred million people. Uh, I, it's, it's, you know, there's just so much going on. There's so many different levels of it going on. Uh, yesterday, they made an announcement there to push and win. They want 30 gigs of offshore wind by 2030. We already got 40 gigs in the pipeline for 2035. So I wonder what they're doing to off, alter this pattern. But yeah, I'm, there's a lot going on. It's hard to keep up with, to be honest. Yeah, I, I also want to reference Rethink X here. Uh, this is Tony Siba's organization. He's famous for the book Clean Disruption. And Tony has done some math that if we invested 200 million a year, sorry, 200 billion a year for 10 years, then we could completely convert the grid to wind, solar, and storage. And by his estimation, it's 1% or a little less than 1% of the US GDP. The question is, is a clean grid, just thinking of the grid now, is a clean grid, a clean economy worth 1% of our GDP? When you think of the, the flip side of that, the cost of doing nothing and just you know, business as usual, I would argue, absolutely. Because the cost is what we saw in Texas. The cost is what we've seen in California mm -hmm. with the fires. There's much more to come uh, in the way of flooding and drought and the disruption of food production, the disruption of coastal communities. 70% of humanity lives near the ocean. And as sea levels rise, that's going to be a disaster uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So... Um, we just have to remember that, yeah, this we, we have to spend our money on something. <clears throat> I say spend it on stuff that's going to ensure a safer future for the majority of people on Earth. Um, because the wealthy elites are going to be able to ride into the sunset on their helicopters no matter what. And, and, and so, you know, it really does matter to you and I, John, in terms of our, our businesses and you know, four hundred billion dollars into clean energy is super substantive. Not that we're not going to have great growth anyway, but we we could have growth squared. Yes. And and um, and it'll be even happier days and a better and a better future for humanity. I mean, we have to be more long sighted about these things. And that's a, and that's that's not easy for humans because we're good at thinking a, a year or two maybe into the future, but not 20, 30. You know, speaking of growth, I'd like to nudge you on the next uh, number uh, story. And uh, sometime in January, the U.S. broke 100 gigs of solar deployed. Um, that's my quick math based on Woodmax saying we were at 97.7 gigs at the end of 2020 and the EIA saying that in, uh, January we did, a we did 330 AC. So we broke, you know, on the AC side alone, we broke the hundred gigs and roughly, if you want to talk about the start of the modern solar industry in the United States, you could call it 1980 if you want 1980 something. Cause we had the first one giga megawatt power plant deployed in the world. Um, you could also call it 2020 because that's when we actually started installing some volume after the Germans and the Europeans did their work. 
but whatever you say, it's either 20 to 40 years. It took us our first 100 gigs. We're going to install our second 100 gigs by 2024, end of the first half. Hmm. Three years. I saw IHS, uh, IHS market, data market. They suggested 27 gigawatts is going to get installed in the U.S. this year. That's a huge number. And they're expecting slight increases the next two years. That's pretty cool. That's a lot of volume. You're talking about some growth, some doubling. That's it. By the end of the decade, Wood Mac is projecting 100 gigs every two years. By some time, and we may be plugging, you know, I did some rough math. And I said, for us to get to 35-ish, 40% of our electricity from solar at current use, we need about 800 gigs of capacity deployed. To deploy 800 gigs by 2035, by the end of, by 2035, if we do a nice smooth curve upward, we're doing like 80 gigs a year in 2035. That's, that's four times our record stupendous amazo year of last year. Grow up 4X, bam, there it is. <clears throat> so that's, I'm hoping I can just hang on. <laughs> Keep the business going. Yeah, these numbers are pretty eye-popping. Um, I'm looking at that table, generation capacity additions and retirements. This is on John's website on his blog, commercialsolarguy.com. Go to the blog. I put it on screen there for a sec, but um, yeah. installed capacity, 153,000 megawatts. Yeah, so that's the FERC number. Of solar. And that, that number is uh, people that are in their queue. So specific, and that's AC. Note that that's AC because these are FERC numbers. There's no DC on the FERC numbers. So that's like 200 gigs in their queues that they see. Uh, if you uh, just a touch lower, there's a report there from uh, Lawrence Berkeley, the National Laboratory, where they note 480 gigawatts of solar in the queues across the United States. The 678 ISOs, RTOs, and then like 30 or 40 uh, utility state level groups almost 500 gigawatts, dude, uh, in the queues across the nation. And it's like, oh, <laughs> that's just whoa, 500 gigs. That's cool. Yeah. A lot of solar. So we don't hear a lot about Pennsylvania in the news, in the clean energy news. I know that you're active in that state, John. Yep. There's what, what one developer called to me a very uh, prospective community solar market, mm -hmm. high risk, high reward. Yep. Um, but uh, in the pre-show, you and I were chewing on the, the news here about Pennsylvania. I'm going to put this on screen. Governor Wolf announces largest government solar energy commitment in the U.S. Heretofore, Pennsylvania had a meager 10% renewable portfolio standard by 2021, but that's kind of the thing is they're, they're reaching their goal now, apparently. Well, and, they, and they only get like 0.5% of their electricity from solar. So I don't know where that other 9.5% is yeah, coming probably from. Probably hydro. Okay. Like it could very well be. They have you know, nuclear, but I'm sure that doesn't count as renewable. And, uh, but anyway, they're now saying that they're going to get half of their of the state government mm -hmm. power. So just the government operations is going to be fifty percent uh, solar, which is cool and awesome, a good leadership thing. But let's be let's be clear: it's not a huge capacity. I look at that second row. We're talking one hundred and ninety-one megs of solar yeah. to bring 400 electricity bills. And they mentioned the 400 electricity bills somewhere I read about. So, so that's good volume. And cause the state, <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of volume for the state cause the state only has like seven, eight, 900 megs of solar deployed total. They're not even at a gig and Pennsylvania is a huge state. So it's going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's a hundred, it's 200 megs. So it, uh, it jumped the state's 25%. It's a good um, push 50% of the electricity, that's awesome. Um, all, all neat stuff. Uh, the market there in PA is just, it's just 
squeezing right at the edges, man. Um, people are signing deals. There's a lot of, a lot of projects in the, uh, uh, in the queue already for the PJM on their website. So it's watching it ongoing. It's interesting. We have some projects signed there. We're hoping to, you know, just ride a long wave. It's going to take a couple years though, before they finalize things and they've not even signed any legislation yet. Uh, just recently, a new law was submitted to start moving on it, but it's going to take a bit, you know, it's going to take a year before projects can be officially signed off on and get funding. Uh, we're, we're, we're signing contracts with, we're signing land lease agreements with landowners though. So, I mean, it's, and plenty of others are, there's, there's a couple hundred projects in the queues from some of the headlines I've seen. Yeah, you know, uh, upwards of 20 states have community solar markets now in the U.S. of various flavors. So that's almost half of uh, the states in the U.S. now have community solar. Of course, it's it's clustered, you know, in a, in a handful of states that have real active markets like the one you're in, Massachusetts, New York, um, Minnesota. Illinois, Minnesota, Minnesota, and... Um, California has the CCA model, which is a, a utility scale, <laughs> a utility scale, utility company, uh, community solar. Uh, yeah, sort of community kinda. choice aggregation. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's different flavors of CCA. Uh, California has their own flavor. I'm no expert on that. But how, what, is the anal what is the analogy between CCA and community solar? So community solar is really just one power plant where you sign up individuals to take a percentage of it and you do them one offs. A CCA is where you have a company find a whole bunch of them and then you sign up for them. And so you, so a CCA is really, you know, if you have one community solar plant as a developer, we'll often turn it into a single legal entity and it's called community solar project number one, LLC of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And we'll find the 50 subscribers to it and they'll buy off from that one little power company. Maybe we'll have a, a, a whole bunch of little projects uh, underneath it. Yeah. Pardon. Sorry about that. Maybe we'll have a few projects together, but it's still set off that way. In California, this is a borderline electric utility. They have responsibilities to the state to have so and so clean electricity. They have to now have energy storage. They get to take over clients like uh, it's a much more organized, aggressive way to buy your electricity from somebody who isn't your main utility provider. And it's, it's community solar on steroids with financial backing and the community solar people out there. There's one called, I think Marin, M-A-N, maybe it's the Marin County Community Solar Group, but it's actually got from Moody's a, a ranking that's uh you know, something above junk bonds. It's like something that's investor grade. Cause I remember writing about it like a couple of years ago that they were the first yeah, okay. CCA that was investment grade. And, uh, you know, so, so their community solar one step up corporate community solar, maybe, I, I don't know exactly. I think they say Marin that's the county Marin. just North of San Francisco. Uh, just, uh, just above the Bay bridge there or the golden gate bridge. Sorry. Um, a very progressive part of, of the state of California. So that makes sense. Here in Illinois, we have another analogous system, which is municipal aggregation, where groups of municipalities will get together in a buying cooperative to buy power. Like in Urbana, where I live, we're part of a municipal aggregation and we buy 100% wind and solar power. So my home technically is powered by renewable electrons even though those electrons are mostly made in iowa wind farms and then wheeled over here which is not realistic um so the actual electrons are actually made at the clinton power station down the road where i ran my marathon this weekend which is a one gigawatt nuclear plant that's the largest power plant in my neck of the woods and the and the laws of physics say that the electrons are going to flow to the source you know from source to sink <laughs> Uh, in, in the most efficient manner possible. But anyway, that municipal aggregation is also a really good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always get confused between CCA and municipal aggregation, but all these it's... things are good. You know, th this is all part of the DG landscape, right? Putting the power in consumers' hands, basically in, in various forms and giving them choice. 
it's it's okay if you really want to buy dirty power go for it but i'm going to buy cheaper solar and wind power and save money and clean the grid and that's and that's where that's the the tipping point that has been reached that tony so siva is so you know good at highlighting i agree well we we have time for one more story, I guess, if you want to do it, or we can say sayonara. Well, we have to do it because you talked about it in the opening. So we got no choice but to have one more story, Tim. Come on now. We got to talk oh, about Calif California net metering. Yeah, dude. And, and I'm so excited um, <clears throat> because I'm having the executive director uh, on the show, the executive director of CALSA, uh, the California Solar and Storage Association, they are, um, you know, California is the most mature solar market in the U.S., even though there's more on a per capita basis in Hawaii. The industry as a whole is more mature in California than any, anywhere else. And California is getting upwards of 50 percent clean solar wind on the grid on a sunny day. Or is it solar wind and nuclear? I don't know. Um, uh, solar wind and hydro. And uh, sometimes and in moments they're going way beyond that in moments they're yeah 98 percent you know meeting all demands type of stuff but so if you don't know this net metering is a foundation for distributed generation for solar and wind to be a thing if if a state shuts down net metering or allows net metering to be shut down all the, then the the renewables industries really take it on the chin what net metering does is it levels the playing field. It says if you make electrons from clean sources, they are equal value to grid power. And so if I put solar on my home and then I'm paying nine cents, the, the, the value of my solar power is nine cents. And that incentivizes me to install solar on my roof, right? Because then I can really attack my power bill with solar energy. Now in California, there are, they're looking at what they call net energy metering, NEM 3.0. They're on NEM 2.0 now, going to NEM 3.0. Well, of course, the utilities are attacking NEM. This is what utilities do. They perceive DG as a threat because they're in the business of generating electrons. And so they go, well, if you want to compete with us, we're going to compete and we're going to fight back. And... Uh, unfortunately, if you don't have net metering, if you don't have retail net metering, then you're not going to have a good solar industry because it completely devalues the value of, of renewables. So anyway, um, Ms. Del Chiaro is coming on the show, uh, cool. I think tomorrow, to talk about this. So this will get published next week sometime. And I'm excited to, uh, to break it down. She knows way more about this than I do. And what is going on in, in the Northeast with net metering, John? Because here in Illinois, even, we see a cliff coming where they're going to start trying to back off retail net metering. Once we hit 5% of clean power on the grid, then that opens the gates for the utilities to back off of retail net metering. Well, Massachusetts, for business, uh, already chopped net metering by 40%. So as of 2018-ish, uh, net metering is uh, sixty percent of the value. Just it's a straight forty percent. Um, different states are, you know, there's fundamentally no net metering in um, <clears throat> New York. They have Veter, value of distributed energy resource, where they determine the value of your energy on the grid. Gets you anywhere from eight to twelve, thirteen, fourteen cents. Maybe more if you're down by the city. Then it's a whole bunch, twenty, thirty cents. Um, and so there's no net metering uh, there for large projects. Um, you know, New Jersey has full net metering and it seems to be holding there. Uh, Pennsylvania seems to be holding net metering, but we really don't know what's going to happen with this community solar. Uh, so, you know, the markets are different and evolving, you know, for a small scale for residential, there's 100% net metering in Massachusetts, but it's, it's evolving. It's going to, the utilities will push, the utilities will try to do their thing. In Hawaii, there is no net metering. Uh, net, Hawaii is an aberration for now, but Hawaii is the future. Um, Hawaii says you cannot export electricity to grid anymore. 
uh, with new installations because we've got too much. We've got too much solar. It's 20, 30, 40% of the houses have solar on it. Um, in Australia, they're starting to say that we're going to tax you for exporting. We're going to charge you similar to the way we charge utility scale for making use of the resources. But of course, there's uh, elite control there that's uh, bending, bending the numbers. So, so this net metering thing is going to matter a lot. Um, it's going to get pushed on. The utilities have stated that they're going to go to every single fight, every single state and fight it. That's the way the utilities say they are now. They say, we got no choice. Initially, we were like, ah, who cares about net metering? But now solar is eating our lunch and we have no choice. So net metering is really important. It's going to go away, though, one day. Energy storage at home is going to get rid of net metering. And that's really what's going to happen is that, you know, California has already altered net metering and forced time of use if you get solar. So your daytime electricity value crashes. It's no longer worth nine cents. It's not worth five cents. But your evening electricity is worth 25 cents. So you're motivated to install a battery already in California, their time of use. Uh, so that's going to keep happening. Now, the utilities will use the constant line. Solar people are stealing. They're taken from the grid. Billions and billions. Nah, that's bull. That's BS. Sorry, I was about to cuss on your show there, Tim. Uh, that's BS because uh, we see that distributed solar saves the grid and you know uh, saves the grid significant money, upgrade fees. And then, of course, we can go back to Texas. People who had solar plus storage at home, they didn't go without electricity. And uh, that distributed resilience, that needs to be accounted for. Maybe net metering should account for distributed resilience values. You know, we, I think net metering is important at minimum so that the little person can tell the man to go stick it because the man needs to have something in their ribs forcing them. Otherwise they get fat and lazy. That's just the nature of the machine. That's the nature of the way we are. I will get fat. And if, if, if that's the way, when I turn into a hundred billionaire, Tim, I'm going to get fat. That's just going to be the way it works. And you need somebody fighting you to keep you real. And we have to fight them. Uh, it's just the nature of power struggles on in this universe of ours. And uh, I, I think that metering is really, really important philosophically. So go yeah. I I do too. I'm glad you pointed out the solar and storage thing. I mean, that is kind of a workaround. Mm -hmm. Um, We all need solar and storage. It should be, it should be regulated that every home is a microgrid. Every neighborhood is a microgrid and and that day will come Mm -hmm. Um, probably in 20 years, you know, it'll take that long, but, uh, but in the meantime, you know, I just, I think that we need to remember that the utilities are here to serve. They are a public service and they're not a privilege. They're, they're a service. It's like running water and sewage and electricity. They should all be very affordable. And if we can make them on site all the better, because it's better for the grid, we're going to have a more resilient grid on mass and it's better for the pocketbooks of our consumers. With that, how do our listeners find you, John? Commercial solar guy. Just type it into the internet thing and you'll see my face all over. I like and, Twitter. I like LinkedIn. I like my website. <laughs> yeah, your, your, your Twitter handle is solar in mass. Mm-hmm. Uh, was the commercial solar guy not available on Twitter? Is that why you took a different handle? Yeah, commercial solar guy is too long, too many characters. Uh, so, so solar in mass is, you know, it's a double there. You get solar in massive amounts and solar in Massachusetts, because that's where the company started. <laughs> Good stuff. And I am Tim Montague, your co-host. You can reach me at cesnrg.com forward slash events and forward slash podcast. We do live events every month. Here's Peter Kelly Detweiler teed up for our April live talking about his new book, The Energy Switch which is all about how companies and customers are transforming the electric grid, just as what we talk about here every day on the Clean Power Hour. And then the Clean Power Hour, you can find at that podcast link. If you just scroll down a little ways, you'll find all of the episodes. Today is episode 38. I want to thank you, John Weaver, for being here and bringing us such wonderful news on the clean energy transition. Have a great week and let's grow solar.